there are really four core reasons of why we, we believe this acquisition is favorable for H&M. Um, first of all, on a macroeconomic level, uh, M&A transaction in terms of valuation and how much we can acquire the company for is still relatively cheap. Second of all, because H&M and MW target mostly a similar demographic, the two brands under one roof can really cross leverage each other's, uh, each other's brands, taking advantage of the foot traffic that's generated and to boost revenue volumes going forward. And what we want to say with this chart is basically an estimated implementation uh, strategy with our two uh, store models. So the number one is a combined store format with MW and H&M under one roof. And the second one is slowly converting current MW stores into standalone H&M stores. And as you can see, the gradual trend is we would like to increase the number of H&M stores in the future and switch out of the combined store format to establish a stronger footholding for the H&M brand. And in the first six months, we would like to focus on developing a strong negotiation strategy that we're really confident about and implementing the first set of uh, unique stores in six months time and after that we would like to establish a continuous feedback loop that will allow us to adjust our strategies forward going forward okay now I'm going to walk you through the de deals uh, details we expect the acquisition to generate an IRR of 15% with an expected premium of 25% now we understand that you would like to finance self-finance any projects so we are financing 70% out of your cash and 30% out of your retained earnings and this acquisition, we believe, will generate a five billion kroners synergy in five years' time. So let's step, step back for a minute and focus on the big picture. So what I'm about to tell you here is summarizing the entire impact from three of our core recommendations. And it's important to point out that the numbers you see on the right-hand side are not comparable metrics, so I'm going to do them individually. The first one I will go over is the organic growth, and that's really focusing on growing the number of stores we have globally. As you can see, these percentages break down the target areas that we want to focus on. The second strategy is inorganic growth through our acquisition of MW. And from a profitability perspective, we expect a 4% contribution to the total company's EBITDA going forward. And the third strategy we have through e-tailing we expect to generate an annual increase in same store sales growth of 4%. And the total impact we hope to see is 122% revenue increase in five years time. And through the same three strategies, we expect ROIC to be 40% and a potential stock upside of 48%. I heard a couple of sighs go through the room when you heard that revenue increase. So obviously we have to ad address some of the risks associated with all of our strategies. First and foremost, I want to talk to you about the real estate ownership. This is a significant deviation from H&M's traditional strategy. The reason we brought, it, we brought it forward is because it's an interesting access into the Chinese market that will allow you to significantly ramp up your exposure in that country. The mitigating strategy is if that real estate access is not something that H&M is willing to pursue. What we recommend in that case is that you sell off the real estate assets of Meters Baonui and allow the, uh, or try to formulate a deal with the company that you're selling the, the real estate to in order to lease back that space. Finally, this slide outlines the detailed implementation plan for our first two strategies of Live H&M and the online offline integration. I wanna highlight here the benchmarking and website redesign that takes place over the first six months and the online store rollout that takes place over the next several years. This is an integrative process that needs to be reevaluated. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this. H&M has had tremendous success over the last 25 years. The stats are truly staggering in so many ways. What our recommendations do is it allows H&M to take the success that they've had and translate that into what we believe is much more important, success in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. So we will now have our Q&A session. And you
during the Q&A session, only members of the jury is allowed to ask questions. Jury, are you ready? 15 minutes, let's start the clock. Uh, thank you very much for a very impressive uh, presentation. A lot of uh, literature uh, and experience says that mergers and acquisitions sounds uh, better than they end up uh, becoming. Very real for us here as well. But uh, the thing is, I'm wondering what makes you uh, sort of assess that this will be a successful one, especially since you say it's a little bit no, you say it's a significant deviation from the current way of working. So please elaborate why you think it will work. So the reason that we outline this as a significant deviation is because of the asset holdings of the company. They have a large uh, amount of real estate on their books, which is not something that H&M has traditionally done. The reason that we believe this will be a successful acquisition is because of the rapid growth of the market that we're entering and the limited success that we've so far been able to see H&M accomplish in the Chinese market in the greenfield status. There are alternatives that we could consider should this acquisition not be successful. However, we do believe that this is the, the greatest opportunity for H&M today. Um, what would the backup plan be for China if this acquisition uh, doesn't go through? So I alluded to that in my last answer. Um, so Greenfield, uh, Greenfield expansion is what H&M has traditionally been experiencing. That is still an opportunity. We didn't go after that opportunity because we thought this was a more attractive one. However, the Greenfield expansion still exists should the acquisition not be one that is, is, uh, will not be one that H&M is willing to pursue or if it doesn't work. The second opportunity is a joint venture. We've identified a couple of, uh, couple of organizations that would be attractive to enter into a joint venture with. Uh, the, top, the first one that comes to mind is the acquisition target, Mirrors Bonway. If the acquisition does not work, a joint venture is a possible avenue. If the joint venture does not work with Mirrors Bonway, other companies exist as well. Furthermore, beyond that, there's the Greenfield expansion that H&M has already been addressing. But, but, but now I'm a little bit confused. So you say it's either organic, uh, joint venture, or acquisition. So which is it? So our recommendation is a large investment in the acquisition, as well as some organic growth on the side. We did not recommend a joint venture in this presentation, and that's an alternative. I would like to compliment you on your M&A strategy. Uh, if you are a global company, you have global competitors, and either you uh, control them, or you merge with them, or you buy them. If, uh, I mean, every industrial, large industrial, uh, global company, they do have an M&A strategy, whether it's banks, or shipping lines, or brewers. And if you do not have a, an M&A strategy, then you are a regional company masquerading as a global one. So I'm glad that you have been provoking the company because they're rich enough, they're loaded with money, and they should put it to good use. So uh, uh, just uh, a few uh, words of compliment for, for the M&A strategy. I'd like to ask, you had uh, Brazil as one of these segments as well. Did you deselect that or did you, what was your approach there? Because um, there are some different characteristics of that market compared to China. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Did, did you deselect uh, Brazil? You had Brazil as one of the key markets as well. You deselected that. Sure. Uh, we did look at other future markets that H&M has not expanded into yet. Brazil is attractive as one of the emerging markets because it does have a growing mid middle class that wants to buy more things. We did not choose Brazil simply because China is a much greater investment. We already are behind our competitors in this huge market, and we have a very attractive acquisition target at this moment. As Josh alluded to in his slides, we are seeing Brazil as the future for H&M, and we will have strategies for that. <coughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, since uh, I represent H&M here, and uh, also my jury colleague here, uh, the reason why you think we haven't considered mergers and acquisition so far? <laughs> so the reason why when we thought, sat down and thought about why H&M hasn't done this in the past is predominantly because of its large uh, presence and essentially standing on the top of Europe, especially in Northern Europe, that you're comfortable there, it does incredibly well, and that even a uh, 5 billion kroner acquisition in China is still only contributing 4% EBITDA. Like, really, you don't have a lot of problems. So the reason why, uh, ultimately, 
this wasn't a decision because of HM's strong brand presence and that we looked very hard to find an acquisition target that matches H&M on its fast fashion, on its customer demographic, and its perception in the market. And for those reasons, we don't think that if you hadn't found those before, you wouldn't have made a strategically important uh, M&A. Could I uh, <coughs> stay on, on the acquisition strategy? Um, Obviously, this is a fairly large acquisition, uh, and, and with the limited uh, history and e experience in, in doing that, uh, don't you think uh, that that the sort of the defocusing of management that would go into that could could be quite a risky way to stay out, particularly as the company does seem to have some challenges in the, its core business? And secondly, uh, if you do believe that acquisition is the right way to go, is that is that a general view that actually they should look for? for perhaps uh, smaller acquisition targets in, in all markets where they want to they expand or, or enter? So the reason that this acquisition itself was presented, as opposed to any others, was because of the particular characteristics of the Chinese market. It largely stems from the fact that this is a huge growth opportunity that our analysis has shown H&M is currently not, not getting as much of as they could. The recommendation to move into the Chinese market through an acquisition is largely driven on the fact that it's a <coughs> rapid expansion. It's not necessary for your company to be able to, uh, to do that in every market it enters. It's just this one in particular was seen to be very attractive. As far as breaking down management's time between the important factors of running a business, obviously acquisitions are a huge use of management resources. However, we believe that the lucrative value of this acquisition will make it worthwhile for H&M today and if this is successful, it could be potentially used as a model for a Brazil entrance. Although this is not part of the recommendation we're making today, it's something that you could use. Well, um, next in line, um, this is a question of the service and the operation of the stores that you're going to operate here. You're going to increase the number of stores dramatically over the next few years. Uh, my concern is, what about culture, the H&M ex experience? How are you going to handle that in new territories where cultures are very different, management styles are very different? Um, is this a change of the basic idea of how H&M is actually run? So the first thing that we looked at was we went through your uh, annual report and we found out you're already doing best practices as far as training and development and that when you open new stores, you take managers from your existing markets, put them in new markets, potential marketers, managers from new markets and train them in existing markets. So from a store manager point of view, we don't see changing anything. To keep the culture consistent and directly address your question, those six values that we put up at the beginning of the slide are, is what's really going to drive um, the consist consistent culture. And we see that H&M needs to have consistent values globally, but in the regional markets, it's going to need to define what entrepreneurship what one team, what cost effectiveness is in each of the individual markets. We do this through our Live H&M strategy, which you saw being um, engage current employees and provide a guest experience. This is that we are creating a environment where H&M employees live, breathe, and sleep the H&M uh, spirit afforded by your cultural ambassadors that go to each of the new markets and train. And then those uh, individual employees will then create the world that H&M guests will then live in. And then a question regarding supply chain. H&M has a quite different way of supplying products compared to the main competitor. Did you consider moving in the same direction as the competitor, or do you think the way of, of doing things right now is, is the way it should be going forward as well? Thank you. Uh, so the first thing that will outline is the fact that the nearest competitor or the alternative would be something considered as Zara's pure play strategy of to market in two weeks. H&M strategy being uh, a 15 week to market with 100 designers in Stockholm and then 700 international suppliers, 16 regional distributors. What we found out when we did our analysis is that in 2007 you actually created a company called H&M um, H&M ABG, which su manages your supply chain and the logistics of that whole process. To turn around and negate that strategy four years later seems a little um, out of character for H&M. The second thing is that H&M uh, is, the supply chain itself is now um, not what H&M prides itself on as so much as the clothing it provides. It doesn't need to be the fastest, but it has to have the right clothes for its markets. 
I, 